Hi everyone and welcome to this Whole School Send webinar. I'm Erica Wollstonehome, the Southwest Regional Lead for Whole School Send and with us today we also have Ian Hunking who is the director of the Sigma Teaching School which is part of the Delta Education Trust and also we've got Francesca and Natalie from Whole School Send who are going to be providing some technical support. Now I'm going to go through some of the technical information which I'm going to read to make sure it's accurate. So if you haven't attended one of our Zoom webinars before, there are a few different ways that you can communicate with us. If you've got a specific question for Ian or myself, you can submit them through the Q&A box below. We've got over 400 attendees with us today, so we expect quite a few questions. We'll try and answer some of them live, but any we don't get to will be collected and answers will be sent out with the slides. There's also the chat function, which you can use to introduce yourselves and network with the other people in the webinar. Please ensure your chat function is set to all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comments. We'll be sharing the presentations with you on screen today. If you feel they're too small, go to the top of the screen, select viewing options, and change your zoom ratio to 150%. We also recommend watching the presentation in speaker view with the chat open in side by side view. We'll be sending out a survey tomorrow, which you can use to feedback on the event itself. We'd really appreciate you taking the time to fill this out so that we can improve our events and all the presentation slides will be sent, will be shared with you as well in the follow-up emails. So enough of the technical information. Ian is our main speaker today, and this is the first in a series of webinars, the theme of which is returning to school and making the use of trauma-informed approaches. Ian trained as an educational psychologist He's been the director of a multi-services agency and a head teacher. And since schools closed for the majority of their children, Ian has published a series of resources to support both adults and children, which he has provided free. Um, this information has certainly resonated with me and influenced my approaches both professionally and personally. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Ian now. Thank you very much, Ian, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Erica, for that wonderful introduction. Welcome, everybody. It always feels slightly strange talking to a blank screen, but I can see from the numbers that you, you guys are out there. So hopefully you can hear me well. Um, as Erica said, we will be sharing the slides, so you'll get a copy of the things that I'm going to make reference to today. I'll also do some signposting. So you can see from the title there, this is the first of three webinars happening on a fortnightly basis. Um, we're going to be returning to school uh, and thinking about trauma-informed approaches, and particularly today, those five key considerations for everyone's well-being the children and young people's well-being, equally importantly for our well-being and our colleagues' well-being. So what I'm going to aim to do in the next hour is a bit of an overview, really, of some of the research, the key messages from research around children and young people who've experienced trauma. Um, I'm also going to give you an opportunity to start to reflect, and I'm hoping that reflection will give you both reassurance to feel, yes, I'm doing a lot of those things already, which is terrific, um, but equally, I'm hoping it will um, make you think of things that you might want to have a go and try at, talk about with colleagues, give a go, support other people with. And I'll also, because I've only got an hour, I will signpost you to various other bits of information, not least the online um, training course that Erica made reference to. So if you go to Sigma Teaching School, and I'll, I'll give you a, a specific link to that, and if you Google Sigma Teaching School, there is a kind of weekly, there's seven of them now, the seventh one's up today. There's seven online sessions that you can pick and choose between that will go into things I'm going to touch on today in a lot more detail. Um, a couple of things um, you probably picked up about me already. I talk very fast. Apologies for that. I will try and keep slow and steady. But again, as I haven't got a great deal of feedback, that's kind of me self-regulating. So I'll do my best. Um, similarly, on, on the right hand side of the screen you've got at the moment, um, I will be evidence-based. 
I'm going to try and be practical and I'm going to give you things that you can specifically use. But actually, everything I talk about today will have an evidence based. My background is as a psychologist. So it really won't be Ian says it will be things that are based in good evidence from both psychology and neuroscience. But the great news is there are some really, really practical evidence informed, trauma informed, trauma reducing interventions that we can put in place to benefit everybody at this time. The, the things I'm going to talk about are essential practice for children and young people who experience trauma. But actually, like a lot of interventions and approaches for children and young people with additional needs, they're actually good practice for all of us. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to bear that in mind as I work my way through. I'm going to kind of work my way through. So the context, first of all, I'm not suggesting for a moment that everybody, every one of us, children, young people and adults, is going to end up traumatised by these extraordinary times that we live through. But the reality is some people will end up traumatised, some people will be re-traumatised. And, and even for those of us who are not traumatised, actually we will be impacted, we will be affected by what is happening at, at these very strange times for all of us. And if I start with that picture that I've put up about patterns of stress, this is from the work of, of Dr. Bruce Perry, a, a neuroscientist and psychiatrist. Um, what he's identified in, in that slide is that effectively when we have stress that is predictable, moderate and controllable, actually that type of stress um, actually can lead to resilience. If we have that stress in a manageable way for all of us, um, and we have that alongside relational support, relational buffering, as he describes it in his research, actually those sorts of stresses can build resilience. And actually we're, we are remarkably resilient as a, as, a, as a species. So it's not all bad news. However, when somebody has, anybody experiences unpredictable, extreme, and or prolonged to that kind of toxic stress combination. Um, that is unfortunately when people are more likely to have a longer term impact from that stress, um, especially if they haven't got the relational support, which we'll touch on today alongside that stress. Um, that's when it can lead to sensitization changes in their neurobiology and actually vulnerabilities, including traumatization. So we're going to be thinking very carefully about what we can do to support children and young people and our colleagues to have more predictable, moderate and controllable stress where we can. But I'm afraid at this current time, sadly, that unpredictable, extreme and prolonged stress does sound like the scenario that we're all living through to an extent currently. The good news is, as I say, we're remarkably resilient. The other bit of good news is that there are approaches and interventions that are informed by evidence that can make a really significant difference. So I'm going to share some of those with you today. And as I put at the bottom of the screen there, um, this is an opportunity. It seems almost trite, I know, to talk about opportunities at this very difficult time for all of us, but it is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to come together as communities, as schools, to really think about what we do already that is inclusive and that is trauma-informed, and, and perhaps even double down, think about what we can do additionally to be even more trauma-informed, to be even more trauma-reducing for everybody, and certainly to think carefully about any ways that we're currently trauma-inducing and what we can do to change that. So what I've done with the research for, for this webinar, the first of three, is I have through the research, I've picked out five key things, five key considerations for everyone's well-being. Uh, and what I'm going to do in the next hour is I'm going to kind of work my way through each of those. There'll be an opportunity for questions at the end, not a long period for questions, but if you want to put any questions in the chat box, Erica, Francesca and Natalie are going to keep an eye on those questions. Um, when I stop with five, ten minutes to go, they're going to kind of say, these are the sorts of things that are coming up and I'll do my best to answer those um, as, as we go along. So I'm going to work with the first five. We're going to start with focusing on trust, safety and safety in addition to learning and I'm going to start again with a picture that hopefully is there for all of you of, of, of the circles. I, I've deliberately represented that as it is because the first message I want to get across is the number one key consideration is that we don't have a choice to make. It isn't a choice between as we are reopening schools and young people are coming back to schools and also with the remote learning carrying on for some. It's not a choice between focusing on learning or focusing on relationships and in particular trust and safety as the elements of relationships. Actually the, the research is extremely clear. If we do not focus specifically on both safety and on trust, the learning simply won't happen. Um, the neuroscience is very clear to us that if, if we don't feel safe and we don't have trust, um, then as I've tried to represent in that picture, where if either one of those circles or certainly both of those circles disappear, the learning simply will fall down. The parts of the brain that we need in order to learn will just not be available to us. So we really do need to think about safety and trust, especially at these extraordinary times. Um, I'm going to focus first of all on safety and then a little bit on trust and then move on to the other areas. So in terms of safety, um, we all have, all of us, um, part of the human condition is we all have a window of tolerance. Um, the window of tolerance is the area within which, when we are within that window, it's almost our comfort zone, when we're within that area, that zone, we feel good. 
Um, we we're able to learn, we we're able to socialize, all the good aspects of life are, are available to us. All of our new all the brain is, is online and available. When we were in that window tolerance, all the good stuff happens. But the difficulty becomes that when we are pushed out of our window of tolerance, we will go into a very different autonomic nervous system state. And rather than being open and engaged and able to learn and socialize and all those great things I've talked about, actually we'll get pushed into either a fight flight state or a freeze and collapse state. So actually, if we're pushed into a, a fight flight state, our body will be preparing for whatever we perceive to be threatening, and it will be ready to fight it off, argue with it, run away from it, um, all of those oppositional challenging behaviors that can come in from children and young people. If, the, if we have perceived the threat to be even more severe than that, and we're triggering something in us that thinks that that threat is such a severe threat that it's potentially even life-threatening, and we cannot fight it off or run away from it, and these are all subconscious decisions that I'll come on to talk about in a minute, then actually rather than going into fight or flight, we're pushed outside of our indoor tolerance into a freeze or collapse autonomic nervous state. And if we're in a freeze and collapse autonomic state, we're very withdrawn, um, we're very closed down, we're very dissociated, we're very rigid in our behaviours, we're also very controlling. Um, so for all of us, we try and stay as much as we can within our window of tolerance, but we can be pushed outside of our window of tolerance by stressors. And the stressors happen to us and, and different people's window of tolerance is different. When we are under a stressful situation, for all of us, and we probably recognise this from our own personal experience, our window of tolerance reduces. So actually when any of us are under stress, the window of tolerance shrinks and we are more likely to get pushed out of that open engage state into a fight, flight or a freeze and collapse state. Um, so as, as, we, and, and as I tried to mention, when we're pushed out, we obviously both perceive and interact with the world very, very differently. We can't learn, we can't socialise, we, we're not in a place where we need to be, that safety and that trust isn't in place. So we need to try and make sure we stay within that. If we are experiencing stress that is prolonged, unpredictable and, and extreme, the, the kind of stuff that leads to vulnerability and, and sensitisation, then unfortunately what happens is the impact on our window of tolerance becomes longer term doesn't stay forever and I'll talk to you a bit later in this webinar about things we can do to re-expand um, children, young people and adults window of tolerance when it has been shrunk but if we have that toxic stress one of the things that happens that is part of trauma is our window of tolerance doesn't just reduce for the period of time of the stress but actually it stays reduced for a longer period so we, we spend less time within that window of tolerance Unfortunately, the other thing that happens when we've had the, uh, the, the kind of toxic stress over a period of time is that we also get a sensitized stress response. So the alarm system in our brain, the bit represented by the, the red dot in the brain there in the amygdala, um, that is our alarm system that scans the environment constantly to see if we are safe or to see if we are not safe and if there's any threat in the environment. Um, if that perceives there to be threat, then it triggers into what, us into one of those different autonomic nervous system states. So we, if we are experiencing stress for a long period of time we end up traumatized we will have a reduced window of tolerance so we're more likely to be pushed easier to be pushed out of our window of tolerance by less stress and equally less threat and we also have a sensitized stress response an alarm system that's overactive in our brains which makes it even more likely. so what happens for those children and young people and adults if we've had trauma we are more likely to spend significant amounts of time oscillating between that kind of Open, the, the kind of flight, flight, the kind of triggered active mobilization or the um, for defense or the um, freeze collapse kind of immobilized defense system and very limited time, unfortunately, in, in the green open engaged state. So the green open engaged state is where we need to be. And I'm going to talk about some strategies to help us stay there and get us back into that state. But for people who've experienced trauma, window of tolerance reduced, overactive stress response and therefore more likely to be tipped out of those. It is subconscious. So the bit I put in about this thing called neuroception, um, this is the work of Stephen Porges. Again, I referenced this in the online training. So if you want to know more, have a look and you'll find lots of information about this. But he's recognised that actually what we all do all the time with our amygdala at the bottom of our brains is, is, is we scan um, the environment all the time to say, am I safe or am I not safe? And for us as human beings, one of the things that we've e evolved to really scan in particular is other human beings, the bit that is most threatening to us is how are the other people behaving? Am I safe with them? Are they safe people? Are they not safe people? So we are subconsciously, you'll be doing it to me now, we're subconsciously scanning the environment and what we particularly scan, we're particularly sensitive to, is scanning the non-verbal behaviours of the other people in our environment. So if you're subconsciously scanning the environment for your neuroception and you're picking up that person is safe through cues of safety, so the cues of safety are things like their tone of voice, is it kind of prosity, is it kind of a sing-song? Songy voice, or is it a flat tone of voice? 
flat tone of voice being a cue of threat, a, a prosody and voice, sing-songy voice being much more um, a cue of safety. Are they smiling? Have they got relaxed facial muscles? Um, is, are their gestures open and kind of not closed and threatening? So those non-verbal elements of communication are extremely important and they communicate directly to the subconscious part of the other people that we're interacting with and that are around us in the community. And, and what the work of Stephen Porter shows is if, the, if we intentionally exaggerate our safety cues and non-verbal cues, the prosody in our voice, the smiles in our faces, the gestures, um, the ways that we interact, making intentional attempts to communicate regularly with people in safe ways that communicate that through, that actually is even more powerful than that. So actually, if you really want to have somebody stay within that open and engaged, that window of tolerance, if we can communicate safety through our non-verbal communication, that's a really, really powerful way. And I think I mentioned at the beginning, or certainly I put it on the slide, that some of these interventions that are informed by neuroscience and psychology are really remarkably simple, but they're incredibly powerful. The, the impact of us making an effort to intentionally make sure we smile, that we're giving those messages through our tone of voice and through our gestures, that's an incredibly powerful way of helping people stay within that kind of window of tolerance. So that's the first thing we can do to make a big difference to help somebody feel safe, those intentional cues through our nonverbal communication of safety. Clearly, if we're still working with somebody remotely, we need to think about how we do that with telephone conversations, how we do that with um, you know, Zoom link ups, ways of still communicating because it's difficult to get those nonverbal elements across if we're only exchanging emails and texts. So finding ways of, of doing that nonverbal communication. The second element at the bottom of that chart, of that, that pyramid, is that as well as really helping people feel safe so that they can stay within their window of tolerance, we also really need to work on trust. Um, this next bit is a bit visual. So I'm now going to think about the work of a guy called Dan Hughes. And I'll tell you a bit more about that in a minute. But Dan Hughes identified that a number of children and people who've had stressful experiences and potentially become traumatized end up with a thing called blocked trust. And I think it's quite helpful to understand blocked trust. It certainly helped me in my work with children and young people. I'm not saying all the young people end up with blocked trust, but you'll probably recognize this as I talk about young people. So there are some young people who do not trust us. And because they do not trust us, what they do to try and stay safe is that they try and control our behavior. They don't really let us have any influence over them. You might be thinking of some young people in your school that you work with already that don't have that trust. They try and control things, they try and manipulate, um, and that's their way of trying to be safe. Um, a way of demonstrating that, if I can do this without spilling it all over my computer, is with two cups. Um, so apologies for the kind of very kind of simple uh, metaphor, but you will get the feel. In, in really healthy child development, what happens is if one of these cups represents the child or young person and the other cup represents a caring adult, is that we get this wonderful thing going on called serve and return. And in serve and return, the child communicates that they've got a need. So right from infancy and all the way through um, development throughout our lives, they'll communicate that need. So say the baby cries, um, and then to the adult, the caring adult comes along, works out what's going on for child, and, and does a kind of return to that. So there's kind of serve and return interactions. Um, you can't see, but I'm now spilling that all over. Hopefully they won't kind of fizzle out. Um, so we've got serve and return interactions. As they get older, those can take all sorts of different forms. Child might come home excited from school with something to share, communicates that to caring adult. Caring adult kind of responds. Child at school might have a difficult bit of playtime, might talk about that with a key worker. Key worker communicates, goes back. You have this serve and return going both ways. That's really healthy and very important for both learning and development, that serve and return interactions. Unfortunately, what happens for children and young people who have learned not to trust because of their experience and they have become traumatized, actually they end up unfortunately more like this. Um, so rather than kind of being in a situation where you can get this wonderful serve and return, they get blocked trust. And blocked trust effectively looks like me holding this cup, if you can see it, over the top with my hand. What the child and young person will not be doing then is they will not be reaching out for those kind of um, interactions with, with, the, with the caring adults. And equally, when a caring adult is there and available to them, you can imagine what would happen if you try and have a serve and So that blocked trust, unfortunately, mm -hmm. results in those serve and return interactions becoming extremely limited. Um, and actually the child and young person still try to get their needs met, but they try and get their needs met in a controlling way, rather than allowing us to have influence over them. And clearly, if a child and young person is putting their energy and effort and trying to control us, rather than letting us have influence over them, very, very limited in the learning that can actually take place. The really great news in terms of what we can do practically is the work of Dan Hughes. Um, Dan Hughes is an amazing psychologist from America. He works with children and young people who've had a very challenging start to life and have ended up adopted. Uh, and what he identified with around the block trust is these children and young people are going into extremely caring adoptive homes and very caring schools where all of this good enough care was available to them. Um, but unfortunately, because of the block trust, they were not able to kind of access that care. So what he identified is that if we use an approach called PACE, and I'm gonna very briefly mention this now, there's more on it, 
it on the online training, and I will come back to this in some more detail in the third of the three webinars. But if we use a thing called PACE, which is playfulness, acceptance, curiosity, and empathy above on the slide, actually what happens over time if we have paceful interactions with children and young people, interactions that include elements of those, that paceful stuff that I've just talked about, what happens over time is the block trust starts to recede, and actually we wear down the block, the mistrust, the block trust over time, and we can get back into, so the children start to allow us to get back into that serve and return, it's the paceful interactions that kind of break down that block trust, that void, that barrier, that wall that the child has effectively built around themselves, and allow us to get into a, a serve and return interaction, I'm such a we can, so effectively, we can overcome blocked trust, we can rebuild that trust with children and young people when they've had difficult experiences by using paceful interactions. We're clearly not going to use paceful interactions all of the time. We can't get every element of pace into every interaction. Pace is an approach. We don't necessarily take a child off and do 10 minutes of pace like we would a reading intervention. What we try and do is we try in the interactions we're having with children and young people, we try and introduce playfulness, acceptance, curiosity and empathy. So the playfulness can be non-verbal elements. I already talked about from Steve Porges' work, the smiling, the tone of voice, the intentionally having that interaction with the young people. It can also be jokes and banter as we build relationships with young people, things that become kind of a common theme that we talk about. There's the acceptance clearly is about helping the young person feel as though they will be listened to, their voice will be heard, even though on occasion we, won't, we will need to correct and challenge and do things differently. Again, I'll touch on that a little bit more in the second webinar. We need to be curious, we need to want to understand and hear their side of things. And the most powerful of all the elements of pace is the empathy. Um, the bit that I've learned most from Dan Hughes's work is that if we really want to overcome block trust and rebuild that relationship with children, young people, or with colleagues or partners, um, <laughs> sorry, I can't talk partners too, um, if we want to um, use the empathy element in particular, actually really being clear that we want to understand, that we get it, that we care, um, that we do actually want to kind of understand and hear what's going on for them, and, and just slowing that down with the empathy stage. We don't want to rush too much into either reassurance or problem solving. Reassurance and problem solving are both enormously powerful, but actually just slowing down the empathy stage, staying back for a little bit longer, communicating to the child person. Again, very simple to the child young person. I'm really glad you told me that. Thank you so much. Um, that's really helpful. That sounds very stressful. How are you coping? Just a little way of staying with that empathy, communicating that empathy before we go on to the problem solving, which we will need to do. And again, I'll talk about that in a future session. Um, but, but the paceful work, again, lots more information on that on the online course. I'm whistle stopping through things today, but certainly in terms of focusing on trust and safety, trust is about those paceful interactions to rebuild trust, using those interactions over time, and safety is about those safe intentional cues that we give through our communication and through our non-verbal communication. They're the most important things we can do to get the trust and safety in place, and then the learning can follow. Okay, the second thing, that's five, the second of five is that one of the things we can really consider in helping children and young people return to school um, and still be trauma informed and support them to be trauma reducing is we can stagger that reintegration into bite sized chunks. Again, if I start with the picture on the right hand side, the, the children and young people will need time to connect, to reconnect with us as individuals, to feel that they belong to a, a wider community and then eventually feel part of the wider school community. So that sense of belonging kind of develops in bite sized chunks. So keeping those connections, I'm sure you've been doing that anyway through your interactions with children and young people while they've been remotely learning, but keeping those connections, keeping them feel as though they are kept in mind, keeping that interest in the child and young person, where they're actually keeping those kind of, if we possibly can, paceful interactions going. Um, the transitions in themselves are going to be stressors for all of us. Um, any change is, is a stressor that neurobiologically stresses us. Big changes obviously much more than thing. So we want to make those big changes smaller and more manageable as much as we possibly can. We need to break the big changes into small steps where we possibly can. We need to think about reconnecting, regrouping, reorientating. And, and what we're really trying to do, and I'm going to represent this on the next slide, is we're going to try and make those stressors that are inevitable as, as things change for people as they come back into school. We're going to try and make them as predictable as more controllable as we possibly can. I've got a list in a minute of some actions we can take to do exactly that, to make it predictable, moderate and controllable, so that actually it leads to resilience for people rather than leading to trauma and traumatisation for, for, for anyone. Um, the most important element we can do for that, from the work again of Bruce Perry, is we can provide relational buffering. Um, so going back to that picture that we had there of the graph that came from Bruce Perry, if we can make the stress predictable, moderate, controllable as much as we possibly can and provide relational support, relational buffering, somebody who that young person feels safe with and is trusting with alongside the stress to support them relationally through those difficult situations. That is what is going to lead to the most effective way of supporting and building resilience. It's when you have the unpredictable, extreme, prolonged without and with the absence of relational support and relational buffering, that's when the real problems start to occur. 
Okay, I've just got a few examples there. I'll, I'll just mention them to you if that's okay. Um, practical things that, again, the research backs up that we can do to help be more predictable, moderate, and controllable. We can clearly be clear about the structure of the day. We can communicate very clearly. We need to redouble our efforts to communicate and think about how we're getting that across, check that people have understood what we're sharing, minimize things, um, think about the visual timetables, etc. Minimize the pace of change if we can, break big changes into smaller changes. Um, key dates on calendars, um, if we possibly can, we still need to have them there and honor them in some shape or form. If there was due to be some sort of big event for a particular year group, even if with the social distancing expectation that we can't have that event, saying there will be something that replaces that and we'll do something in some particular way, trying to find creative ways of keeping those key dates so we're kind of marking that as we go through. Managing each transition, I'm going to talk about that as the next um, slide in a minute, so breaking transitions into three key elements, I'll explain that to you. Having fun as possibly as far as we can, being playful. Playful is a great way of breaking down defensiveness, so the more playful we can be, um, these times the better. Um, the demand of tasks, I've, thought, I've talked about there, the cognitive demand is going to be a challenge for us and more likely to tip us out of that window of tolerance. So our stretch zone will be limited, so we need to think very carefully about what work we need to repeat and reinforce more regularly and introduce new work quite as often. Um, and then we also need to maintain connection with key staff. I know there's lots of talk about being in bubbles and kind of gradual in openings, etc., for different schools, but actually we need to find creative ways. If this child or young person has got key adults that are really important to them in terms of their relationships, their trust and their safety, we need to find creative ways of keeping those relationships going, whether that's a postcard home, whether that's a Zoom conversation, whether that's somebody keeping a social distance conversation going, but we need to keep those connections. Um, the third element, and this does need a little bit of careful explanation, is about three-part transitions. So um, you've got the graphs again on the right-hand side I'm going to start with. These again come from the work of, of, of Dr. Bruce Perry. And what he's tried to represent on the bottom right hand corner graph there along the bottom axis on the x axis is the, the, the whole day and up the y axis um, along the top uh, up the side is the level of physiological arousal and what he's represented in the bottom of those two graphs is the blue line is a a person who's more neurotypically organized, so they haven't got a sensitized stress response, that they've got a, a reasonable window of tolerance. They, what will happen for them is stress will still increase throughout the day. So you can see the stress gradually increasing as the day kind of goes. So they become more and more physically aroused and they might start to go out of that engaged state where they're open and engaged and start to tip into disengagement, but hopefully not into overwhelm and disruption. What he's trying to represent on that bottom graph is then maybe it gets to lunchtime, and I know this doesn't happen for all of us, but maybe it gets to lunchtime and there's an opportunity for us to, to take some action, which means we can physiologically calm ourselves down a bit um, and if we do our physiology starts to come down slightly and then through the afternoon the, the build things build again and then we get home and hopefully again we can physiologically calm at the end of the day that's that's how Bruce suggests that it works for a lot of us I know it isn't always that simple but the key message is that you know it, it builds the, the, all those individual physical stressors throughout the day build and our physiological kind of um, arousal is likely to go up and up and up um, the red line on the bottom graph on both graphs is representing a child young person or adult who's um, sensitized so who's got that reduced window of tolerance and has also got that sensitized overactive alarm system in the amygdala in the limbic system so they already start with a higher level of physiological arousal they're much quicker to arouse and as you can see as the graph goes up they're more likely to get into an overwhelmed disruptive unable to kind of be involved in education and, and learning going into those fight flight or freeze and collapse states we talked about earlier and then being able to hopefully come down the reason why i share that and the reason why i put the second graph on top is the research might be slightly surprising to some of us, but we really, really need to do it. The research demonstrates that what we can do to really help children and young people, and also we can do to help ourselves, is actually rather than waiting till lunchtime or till the end of the school day, or as teachers, maybe even the holidays or weekend, to do those things that we find calming, that bring our physiology back down and, and recharge our batteries. Actually, the neuroscience and the psychology research is really, really clear. What we need to do is we need to intersperse throughout the day little small doses of physiological calming regulating so rather than us becoming regulated and stress building and building more like the top graph where actually as things are building we're taking physiological breaks throughout the day we're doing emotionally regulating physiologically regulating activities i'll tell you what some of those are in a minute um that we can do throughout the day. And, and what this, the research would really suggest we should do is we should try and build those into our routines um so what i'm suggesting here when i talk about three-part transitions is whenever we have a transition in school from one piece of work to another piece of work or one activity to another 
another, there was an opportunity to build in a physiological, only has to be brief, the research shows us that even two or three minutes um, of a physiological regulating activity, regularly interspersed throughout the day, can make the world of difference in, in bringing us down to a more physiologically regulated state. It provides children and young people with that kind of regulating experience, that safe experience with a member of staff, that relational buffering. And remember, it's the relational buffering alongside bits of stress that help children and young people not only cope, but also over time, that relational buffering, that kind of support throughout difficult times actually starts to help children and young people to re-expand their window of tolerance. So having situations where they are supported, where they feel safe, the window of tolerance starts to expand again over time. And the other great bit of news from neuroscience, again, the work of Bruce Perry, is that actually not only does the window of tolerance start to expand, but also if we have those safe experience and we have relational support alongside stress, what happens is that our alarm system starts to calm down again. So even if we've got a sensitized alarm system, if we have lots of experience of relational support, lots of experience of safety, lots of experience of, of stress being moderate and being manageable um, alongside that relational support, then we will start to return our brain and uh, uh, neuroplasticity of the brain actually changes and actually we return to a more neurotypical um, alarm system, a more neurotypical stress response rather than the sensitized stress response, which is obviously great news to, to then be able to spend more of our time in that open engaged state where we can learn and socialise and all the fantastic bits of life happen. So it's, it's interspersing those kind of physiological regulation breaks throughout the school day. Um, at the bottom of this slide, I've just I've referenced the three things that are the, the research again shows are the most effective ways of, of, of making those physiological breaks. So the, the, the number one thing that we can do both as adults and we can encourage children and young people to do on a regular basis to bring their emotional, regular, their physiological reg regulation down is we can breathe actually taking just a couple of minutes to do some calming breathing activities, slowly and calmly deep breathing, and in particular, slowing down our out breath. So I've called it their 7-Eleven breathing, which is one of many examples. But that suggests breathing into the count of seven, breathing out of the count even in that minute or two, calms our physiology down. Um, to bore you with the science for a moment, what we've got, um, this is the work of, of Dr. Stephen Paul, just the polyvagal theory. Again, it's lots of information in the, in the online training about this, but we have a vagal nerve. The, the vagal nerve connects all of the organs in our body um, to the lower parts of our brain, and it's the, the, the bit that communicates the kind of what we need to prepare, fight, flight, freeze. So it sends all those messages down to the body to say, you need to prepare to either be closing down, preparing for death with freeze and collapse, or you need to be preparing to fight and run away from a dangerous thing. But equally, the communication goes the other way. So it's actually it's 20 percent of a motor neuron um, and actually 80 percent of it is actually communicating the other way. It's a sensory nerve that actually sends information up to the brain and that we can't control at all, most of our organs. The one that we can take control over is our lungs. So the lungs are full of sensors that send information up the vagal nerve to the brain and says, am I safe? Am I not safe? If we are breathing slowly and evenly, that Sense, those sensors in the lungs send messages up the vagal nerve to the brain that say actually things must be okay at the moment we're, we're breathing slowly we're breathing evenly it makes a huge difference to the sympathetic nervous system it calms us down um, because effectively if we are breathing slowly and evenly we're clearly not running away from danger we're clearly not fighting off danger actually um, what we are doing is we're fairly chilled we're fairly relaxed we're fairly calm so it's, it's a really great physiological hack if we spend a few moments as a member of staff ideally with children as well, throughout the day, doing some breathing. There's all sorts of fun and creative ways that I'm sure you'll find to do that with children and young people. Some breathing activities next to us. Again, there's some more examples of how to do that with kids in the online training. So that's a great way of thinking. The, the second one that we can do, um, sorry for the fancy language, somatosensory breaks. So actually doing kind of rhythmical physical activity is another fantastic way of bringing down our physiological arousal. So building those into routines. When I was a reception teacher, one of the things that our children, the children I work with then used to love is rhyming books. So in between activities, we would do, a, I'd, I'd be talking a rhyming book, reading out or saying a line, and children would be doing actions, you know, things like we're going on a bear hunt, they used to love. So, so ways of doing kind of, as we are moving from one activity to another, both fun and physiologically kind of calming rhythmic activities um, with older young people that might involve music, it might involve some dancing, it might involve some yoga, you'll find what works for you. But the breathing and and the physical repetitive and, and the research genuinely shows two or three minutes of that into space throughout the day is a wonderful way of bringing down that that physiological arousal giving us and it's far less likely then that any of us will get into an overwhelmed state because we're taking those regulation breaks throughout the day the third one i'm really really key is that it's social connection um Physiological states are contagious. I'm going to talk about that again a little bit in a, in a future slide. But actually, um, if, if we are in a calm state 
and we all and then we spend time from that calm state with somebody else so if we're trying to calm a child or a young person and we're in a calm state we will because of mirror ne neurons in, in our brains we will have a calming impact on that child or young person if we are in a dysregulated state we can't calm anybody we will then be mirror neuroning stress and, and, and dysregulation to everybody else so we need to make that effort to be in a calm state ourselves we then need to have those social interactions with other young people and those social interactions especially if we combine them with calming breathing and somatic sensory physical interventions make the world a difference in bringing things down but interspersed them throughout the day what i've tried very very quickly on this last this bit of slide is one way of doing that again the research backs up is if we break um, transitions down to three parts so every transition is a bit of a stress for people throughout the day and it triggers stress in, in our brains but if we do that pre-transition phase of doing countdowns to it finding ways of marking the fact that in a couple of minutes we're going to do this you need to start thinking in this way five minutes to finish the activity the countdown type stuff and then we get to the transition phase we can build in some of that physiological regulation stuff as we move and then post transition a kind of resettling routine which maybe could improve some breathing etc we, we can build those physiological regulation breaks you'll find creative ways of doing that i'm sure so that's the third thing that we can do transitions in three parts building in physiological regulation breaks. But the fourth consideration key consideration for everyone's well-being is actually managing transitions for staff as well as for children and young people um, everything i've said in the last 20 25 minutes is equally valid and true for us as staff and for colleagues as, as much as it is for children and young people. We need to make sure that we are looking after each other, we're looking after ourselves even more than we normally would. We need to think about that safety, that trust, we need to think about the reconnection, we need to think about ways in which we can give ourselves regulation breaks throughout the day, um, ways that we can break transitions into smaller steps. All of those things are absolutely fundamental. Again, if I look at the pictures on the right hand side, um, if, as I was saying, physiological states are contagious. So if we are the person who is able to stay in a calm, open and engaged state by thinking about our own physiology and our own well-being, we will be in a much better place to be able to support children because they will pick up on that in, in neurobiology, in their mirror neurons, they will subconsciously pick up on that, they're much likely to stay calm themselves. If we are dysregulated, again, they will pick up on that, they will more far more likely to become dysregulated too. So making an effort for us to stay regulated, for us to stay within our window of tolerance, taking action, including some of those emotional and physical breaks that I've just talked about, those sorts of actions make the world a difference for us to stay in a place and that contagion of helping in a good way, contagion in a good way, helping children and young people stay in a, a physiologically regulated state as well. We need to be that secure base. We are the secure base for children and young people to come back to. Staff need time to reconnect with each other, to regroup, to reorientate, to share their stories, to be able to come back together. We, we need to re-establish ourselves as a team. We need to then, once we have re-established as a team, continuing to have time, protected time, to connect, to share, to plan together. Um, all those things are really key. And again, I've just put a few examples of the sorts of practical things that we can do that will help staff to be as a team to be in the right place so it's about regular protected quality staff time it's about check-ins exactly the same as the children and young people need people checking in on them and providing that you know um, paceful interaction with them where they feel valued they, they feel kind of um, you know, able to be supported those check-ins between colleagues again it only needs to be a couple of minutes but it needs to be regular enormously powerful Self-care, um, making sure that we do. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the second webinar, the second half of the second webinar. We'll talk about some of the things we can do in terms of looking after ourselves and our own well-being. There's again some really key messages from research that I will if you'll have to wait and find out about. Sorry about that, only now today. Um, we need to regularly and clearly communicate. We need to check that the communication has actually landed, that people have understood, they've had the chance to ask questions, people have been involved in things. We need to provide um, reviews, we need to check where we've got to, um, what are we, where are we going next, what are we doing? We need to minimise that change if we possibly can. We need to provide ongoing staff CPD. If only there was some decent online CPD about trauma available, maybe you'd want to have a look at that. There is, I'll signpost you to it. Um, so you know, things on that are useful to learn at this time. If people are having to learn new things and take on new things in terms of online learning, etc., let, let's provide the training support alongside that. And we do need to bond as a team. We need time to do fun things together. Um, so, you know, don't feel guilty um, for doing fun things at this very challenging time. We need to have those opportunities to come together and support and, and do bonding things together as a team. Um, now on to the fifth. Um, going forward and the fifth and, and equally important as all the others in terms of five key considerations that we can do at, at this very challenging time to be trauma informed is that we can build on positive 
um, positives and we can acknowledge challenges. So actually we, we need to build on successes. We need to think very carefully about what are the successes that were there both before the, the, the lockdown with the pandemic and the challenges that we've had, um, but also what are the positives that have happened um, in terms of things that we've put in place during the, the, the lockdown and the very extraordinary times that we live in. Um, for me and the, the schools that I work with in Delta Education Trust, um, the sorts of things that we're making sure we build on is, is our partnership with parents. You know, we have always worked very hard to work with parents, but actually during the lockdown we've had even more regular contact with the majority of our parents. We don't want to lose that. We want to find ways that we continue to build on that kind of partnership approach. Um, we also have been a community that have worked creatively, that have adapted to meet the needs of individual children. Again, we, we want to continue to build on that. You're probably the same. Um, we've, we've got up a level in using technology. If nothing else, and I know it's a really thin silver lining, to a, a very difficult situation. But if nothing else happens during this pandemic and the outbreak, right, surely um, schools' homework policies should be several hundred times better than they were before policies and practices. Um, you know, we, we're really well practiced now, aren't we, in terms of what can be provided remotely, how we can do that for children and young people. I, I would really encourage, if you want to be trauma informed, that some of that remote learning is also relational. Um, checking in on people, using paceful interactions, trying to do that in a in a way that includes those non-verbal elements of communication too, so people feel safe and trusted, as well as looking at the academic. And and then the the other one that may be the same for you, it may not be, but it is something certainly we found in our trust. Is a number of our families, not all sadly, but a number, have actually taken the time to really build on specific special interests. So actually we're going to honour that. We're going to value that as children and people continue in this journey and things start to change. We're making sure we don't lose sight of the fact that they've spent a long time finding out a particular thing they're interested in or things that they've researched and learned. That's fantastic. Let's, let's learn about that. Let's celebrate that. Let's share that. Let's move forward. Um, challenging the next bit, but we need to do it. We also need to acknowledge um, the challenges and as far as possible be future focused. So, so we need to encourage people to be able to tell their stories. We need to encourage people to be able to say what's happened to them, what it's meant for them, how they've coped how they haven't coped, what's changed, what hasn't changed. Um, important bit that I said in, in the, towards the end of that, we, we do also need to think about what has changed, but also what has not changed. I think so much of the focus at the moment is on what has changed. We need to also remind people what hasn't and what's staying the same term, what's more permanent and what will come back. We need to honour people's stories. We need to listen to them. We also very clearly need to be future focused and thinking about how that changes. We do not have to have the solutions for children and young people. When they are sharing things with us, the most powerful thing we can do is listen and empathise. Um, if we do then go on and find a way of problem solving and working with them to overcome some of those issues, which I'll talk about in, in a future webinar. Um, fantastic. But actually, we don't need to feel bad for just listening, just acknowledging, listening, helping them to be able to share their experience, be that a member of staff, a colleague, be that a child or young person. That in itself is enormously powerful. Checking in with people. How are you? How are you really? Uh, what's been going on for you? Um, you know, if they choose not to speak, choose not to tell us, that's fine too. But if they do want to take that opportunity, that, then fantastic. Um, we also, just to finish this, this slide, we need to find ways of, of, of recognising losses and acknowledging uncertainties. I know schools have got some really creative things going on, um, which, you know, so whether that's about lost books or assemblies or ways of celebrating, and, and then also being able to celebrate those fantastic things that happened, the kind of lockdown hero type stuff. Stuff, the things that have gone well in the community, um, all of those things need to be able to be talked about, need to be able to be expressed, and, and not just in this next few weeks, over a sustained period of time, we're, we're all going to be affected by, by what's happened during the pandemic. People need the opportunity to talk about it individually and collectively, they need kind of permission, both as staff and as individuals to have those conversations. Um, on the pictures on the right hand side, I've deliberately put the vision and the bit about connecting, belonging and community at the bottom because we do want to build on successes, but actually we, we really, that's about relationships too. We do need to really make an effort um, to make sure that staff are supported, that we're connecting and supporting each other, um, that we're looking after ourselves individually and as groups. That's the foundation as the secure base for the children and young people support to build upon. I also mentioned the vision. One of the things that I know a number of schools are doing that I think is a really sensible suggestion, but entirely up to you what you do, um, is they're revisiting their vision. I'm not to change it necessarily, but just to say, look, this is our vision and values as, as a community. What does that mean in terms of the actions we're taking at this time? Let, let's really think about how we're going to get through this. A message that clearly says we will get through this together, this extraordinary time, and, and some conversations that we revisit to say, how are we doing that? Are we managing? What are we doing well? What can we build on? What do we need to do slightly differently? Okay, so those are 
super super quick the five key considerations for everyone's well-being hopefully i've got the message across that focusing on trust and safety in addition to learning isn't a choice we really really need to think about our trust and safety those non-verbal elements of communication that communicating safely sounds really simple enormously powerful in helping people feel safe enormously powerful in helping them expand their window of tolerance re kind of come back to a neurotypical stress response rather than a sensitized stress response those safe interactions are um, relational buffering do that really really powerful um overcoming trust pace of interactions um again build rebuilding that trust and overcoming block trust rather than trust. so the really powerful is one in that and then the learning happens it's not if we focus on this what's happening about the learning if we don't focus on this the learning simply won't happen um staggering reintegration of bias chunks we talked about thinking about making that that stress manageable predictable controllable wherever we possibly can and relational support alongside it some practical ways that we can do that three part transitions thinking wherever there is a transition there's an opportunity for us to manage that transition well but also potentially to build in some physiological regulation um, through those different things that could be social interaction, it could be breathing, it could be somatosensory, physical re regulation, drumming, music, and um, all sorts of things we can do. Um, well worth trying, genuinely it works really well. Managing transitions for each other, for staff as well, absolutely fundamental, and then building on positives and challenges. Before I stop for questioning, I'm gonna do two more things. I'm gonna explain very quickly a quick word on confirmation bias, and then I'm gonna sign those two find some more information and ask lots of questions. So you may or may not have heard of confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is represented by that picture on the side of your screen. Um, it, this is common to all of us. We all have confirmation bias and we need to be aware of it and we need to challenge it um, because if, if we don't challenge it, it simply kind of stays at this. So let me explain what it is. When somebody, like you hopefully in the last half an hour have heard from me some things that, that, that are evidence-based and objective fact stuff, what will happen if we don't make an effort is the bit that we will hear, the bit that we will remember and the bit that we will act upon, the bit in the middle of that then diagram is the bit that fits with what we believe already, the bit that reassures us we are all kind of scientific um kind of people who, who kind of pick up bits of evidence that fit with what we know already and what we believe so um, i make no excuse for that it's really great that hopefully a lot of what i said will be reassuring to you and the evidence absolutely backs that up about ways that we are trauma informed and trauma reducing but what i would encourage you to do is really also have a think about anything i've said that maybe is a bit outside of what you believe and what you do now that's the bit that's the objective facts that isn't kind of what currently fits with your beliefs and your actions because that's the bit that's slightly outside of confirmation bias that's the bit where the biggest amount of learning the big amount of change can take place as i say the aims were to feel reassured about the things from research that fit with hopefully lots of reassurance for actions that you're already taking as caring trauma informed and trauma reducing communities there may be one or two things that i've said that you want to talk through with colleagues that might be slightly outside of that that might be slightly outside of what you're doing already having a think about what you could incorporate and what you can do that's when there's an opportunity for, for relearning okay let's do the aims and the signposting and then i will stop and i'll take some questions um so the aims hopefully I've achieved a little bit of, I've started to provide you with some key messages from research. We'll do more of that in future webinars. Um, I've provided you a little bit of an opportunity, as I say, with the confirmation bias, to think about both reassurance and, and maybe one or two things that you might want to take away and try. What I haven't learned a lot of is signposting you. So um, I will signpost you if that's okay. There is the online training course, which is a number of sessions. The first three sessions in the online training course are really the foundations. So there's one about the transformative power of feeling safe, there's one about building trust, and there's one about looking after our own well-being. But those three are really key to kind of work their way through that online. Um, but then there's about four others at the moment that will be new on each week. So there's other things you can then pick and choose and add to. So they're all available um, by this three staff online CPD at that Sigma, um, uh, uh, web address that I've put on there. But please just Google Sigma Teaching School, you'll find it. There's a self-review um, that will come out with the email that will follow with these slides and with some other bits of information and some signposting. So if you choose to, there's a, I think it's only a couple of pages long, there's a self-review that you can look at and it summarises some of the information that I've shared with you during this webinar. You can use that to review for yourself. What things do I do well already? Feel good about those, feel reassured, keep doing those, build on those, but also maybe one or two things you could do differently. So that will come out. You've got two further webinars. You've got one in two weeks' time with me, if I haven't put you off completely. Um, that will be about the transformative power of feeling safe, a bit more on the polyvagal theory, but also what about when it goes wrong? Um, so what do we do to support children and young people when they're really, really struggling, when they're dysregulated, when they're really coping with some great stuff from evidence that we can do to help that young person manage the thing called the four hours approach and a great thing called collaborative problem solving? I'll talk about that in the second half of the next webinar. Two weeks' time. Um, there's also rebuilding trust, which I'll do in the webinar in a month's time, and our own well being, some things, some actions that we can take to look after ourselves. As I say, free online training. I put my, my, web, my um, email there as well. So if people do want to get in touch with me, please feel free to. Questions, comments, feedback, bits that you would like to, to do, anything you want to book in terms of support. For you.
schools. I genuinely hope some of that has been useful to you. Um, thank you so much. So many of you, I can see the huge numbers in the top corner, which is very flattering. I'm going to stop now. I think I'm also right that there's going to be a video version of this available, um, which we'll send out links for as well. So if, if there are bits in this that you know, a colleague has missed or you want to, please feel free to kind of share. Similarly, the, the online training, I, I was doing that for Delta Education Trust anyway. It seemed an obvious thing to do at this extraordinary time to therefore share it with other schools. If, if there's anything useful in there, um, please make use of it, share it with other people it's out there to be used and to be of helpful to people i will stop other than saying we have an opportunity I said at the beginning i'll say it again at the end we have an opportunity to really think at this time about the caring communities that we already are the inclusive communities that we already are what actions can we continue to take and also additionally take to be even more trauma informed to be trauma reducing rather than trauma inducing to support those children and young people and colleagues who are traumatized but also to reduce the level of trauma for those people who could potentially be traumatized Hope it's been useful. Give me some feedback. I will stop and take some questions. Thank you. Um, Ian, I've been looking at some of the questions. So one question mm -hmm. is about activities to reduce stress. Okay. Um, I think you've mentioned some. Are there any others that you'd like um, to add to? Terrific question. Terrific question. So, so when somebody is stressed, the, the most significant thing we can do to, to help them is to provide an adult who is regulated and just have time in. Um, Louise Bomber, another fantastic person who talks about um, reducing trauma, um, actually talks about time in with an adult. When somebody is dysregulated, physiologically dysregulated, and they're stressed, actually time in um, rather than time out, time just with a regulated adult time together is the most powerful thing we can do. Um, clearly, we can also bring down their regulation through some of the breathing that we talked about, through some of the um, rhythmic physical activities. Um, and then, of course, reducing stress, we want to try and make that stress predictable, manageable and controllable. That's extremely easy for me to say, but that is what the research shows. So the more we can be clear about the stress and managing, but managing it if we can, certainly providing relational support. And if we have got a young person who regularly becomes distressed and dysregulated, actually practicing some of those physiological regulation issues. We, we don't, there's a lovely quote, isn't there? We don't want to wait for a child to be drowning to teach them to swim. If we've got a child or a young person, I'm thinking of a young man that, that I work with, um, that, that is a super lad, but he, he does lose his temper. Um, we've done lots of work when he is calm at trying out different physiological regulation activities and he's identified the ones that work best for him so then when he is dysregulated and he comes into my office to spend some time with me and, and we spend time in but we also do some physiological regulation activities together he knows the one or two things that are going to work best for him so he's got some breathing activities he's got some muscle tensing and relaxing activities that we've rehearsed and practiced and, and, and so when his stress level gets too much he comes has some time in with me or with another caring adult and does some of those physiological and, and after a period of time Time. he's ready to talk things through and he's ready to again i will do a little bit more work on that in the second half of the next webinar if that's okay in two weeks time yeah and just to, re to reiterate ian this is as important for us as adults at the mm -hmm. moment isn't it as well as the young people that we work with that we think about how we manage our stress Erica, thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, physiological states are contagious. We, we genuinely need to put on our own emotional oxygen masks first. We, we, we need to be looking after ourselves and looking after our colleagues. If we're going to be that secure base, if, you know, some of the things I've talked about sound super simple. You know, smile at the children, um, smiling, the faces, not flat faces, facial expressions. Actually, when we're feeling stressed and we're feeling overwhelmed, that's the last thing that's going to happen. We're going to have to make a real effort to look after ourselves, to be in a position where we can provide those kind of that good enough care and, and that relational care and that relational approach. So I've made it sound very simple. It really isn't. It's, 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 it's really effective, but actually people need to work very hard to achieve it. And yeah, looking okay. after ourselves. Next is question. Is this reaction and reading of other people around you comparable to children and young people that have attachment needs and hypervigilance? Yeah, so, so there's a huge overlap between the work I've talked about in terms of trauma informed and attachment aware. So you're absolutely right. The, the attachment system is also based in our limbic system um, and the previous experience that we've had will impact on, on where we're at. So things like block trust is very much part of attachment challenges. Um, the, the trauma responsive work is very much in in hand in glove with trauma informed and trauma aware so um you know attachment 
makes reference much more to our earlier childhood experiences, but children and young people who've had difficult attachment experiences will be even more vulnerable now than they were. Again, the work that we are thinking about in terms of helping people expand their window of tolerance, think about their stress sensitivity, those paceful interactions, building relationships with key adults, um, thinking about this, that's extremely good practice for children who've had attachment challenges in early childhood too. Okay, next Great. question. If a child has blocked trust, is it just a case of a consistent approach with pace activities, even when you might not see any visual signs of the block trust beginning to break down? Yeah, again, a great question. So John Balin, a neuroscientist from America, talks about us having to wear down the a mistrust with children. We need to be amygdala whisperers is a beautiful word that he uses. So the amygdala is the part of the brain that is constantly scanning the neuroception, scanning the environment to say, am I safe? Am I not safe? And obviously the whole way that we interact subconsciously changes instantly um, as a result of that. So actually, if we're giving those safe, those paceful messages and we're having those interactions, it doesn't happen over time. What tends to happen a lot if they go through a kind of a continuum of going, I don't trust this guy, to then go, oh, maybe I can trust him a little bit. And then you'll start to feel that a little bit. And they'll go back and forth. And then, and then over time, they'll build trust. So I'm afraid it isn't an overnight solution. It's not the first time you'll be pacing with somebody. But they'll build up. But I mean, I've, I've worked for the last 20 years with children, young people, incredibly challenging backgrounds, huge block trust. It, it's the magic with pace. It really, really works. Those paceful interactions, especially the empathy element of pace, showing somebody that you care. I got told off, I'm afraid, in a webinar earlier this week for swearing, but just to warn people, I am about to swear. Um, one of the children and young people that, that, that we work with at the Harbour School in Portsmouth, summed it up beautifully. She said, actually, what was best about being supported at the school was that people gave a shit. Um, actually, the pace approach really genuinely demonstrates to kids that we do give a shit, and kids that have had difficult times really need to demonstrate that through those paceful caring. But the question, again, is fantastic because it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. We have to wear down that mistrust. Gradually, paceful interactions, children and young people will start to allow us to have some influence over them. Um, but it's a great question because it is a journey. It's a long journey. And we've got a number of other questions, but I'm conscious that we're running out of time. But as we said at the beginning, again, apologies. I know that there have been some issues with sound and transmission for some people, but a recording of this will be available and sent out to you, as will all the slides, as with the references. So just before we finish now, I'm also going to highlight some whole school send um, resources that are available. Um, I'm just getting this up on my screen now, so hopefully everybody will be able to see these um, coming up. Now it should come up, share. Okay, so if I just put this, um, I'm now screen sharing. I hope that you can see these slides. So first of all, they are available. All this information is available on the um, SEND gateway. Um, that, ooh, screen sharing has stopped. Francesca, could you put my slides up now, please? I seem to be struggling to get them up. Let me put, try again. Apologies for this, folks. There we are. Hopefully we've got them and I will also put them onto slide show from current slide. That should work now. So the Send Gateway has, has resources that you can access and you'll see the link at the bottom. And the resources that I think are particularly re relevant to this are the condition-specific intro introductory videos at the bottom, highlighted at the bottom of the screen, and also an, a framework which is called Transition to Adulthood from the Earliest Years. And that's got lots of transition guidance for returning to school, which is really relevant at the moment. So the condition, the sh these are short videos which cover a range of specific conditions. And each one is only about 10 to 15 minutes long, but really worth looking at. If you're interested in accessing any of these resources, the links are here. 
And finally, thank you everyone for attending. We look forward to reading all of your responses. And we also look forward to seeing you for our next webinar, which is on June the 23rd at 4 to 5 p.m. And again, it's considering what do we do about it when things go wrong? Thank you, Ian, for your contribution this afternoon. That was excellent. And thank you for listening, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. That's, thank you for spending time. Appreciate it. Much appreciated.